Welcome back. Uh, we're a couple minutes late. Uh, we've had some additional technical difficulties that we have worked through, but I believe we have that under control now. So we're ready to move on to our next uh, presentation. I have to tell just a little story uh, about Joanne before we get started that was kind of fun when we did our first tech run. Joanne showed up in the room and she said, you know, I'd really like you to get the spelling right on my name. And I don't know if you all have looked at Joanne's name or not. I'm going to put it up in front of me so you see what it looks like. Whoop. If I can. And we all looked at this name and everybody went, oh my gosh, how did we do that? <laughs> and Brenda said, how exactly do you spell it? Joanne said, oh no, it's not the last name. You've got the last name just fine. Your first name, <laughs> the first name is misspelled. So we got a good chuckle out of that. Um, so Joanne Vipayetsky is our next speaker, and we're delighted to have her back. Uh, one uh, quick comment that I have kind of forgotten about before is, uh, just be before I forget about it, uh, when we go to breakout rooms this afternoon, the uh, link for the second breakout room is actually at the top of the screen. So you'll see uh, Michael McKay, the media friend or foe, that's for the workshop, for Michael's workshop. And if you want to attend that, I had said earlier uh, that you had to go back to the email. If you want to switch to that workshop, you can just click the link at the top of your screen to get to Michael's workshop. Uh, if you're participating in Phil's workshop, you just stay right here in the room. We, you don't have to click anything. So uh, we'll announce that again when it's time for the workshops, but let's move on to Joanne's uh, presentation. And I think we have video that's disappeared for a moment. Joanne is an independent journalist and a columnist for Mother Jones magazine. Prior to that, she was an editor at The Nation magazine for 18 years. She has written for that magazine as well as for Harper's, Counterpunch, The New York Times magazine, The Guardian of London, and at some other publications. She's the editor of several books, including Painting by Numbers, Komar and Mel Melamed's Scientific Guide to Art, The Thirty Years' Wars, Dispatches and Diversions of a Radical Journalist, and the, the collected works of Andrew Kopkind. And if I pronounce that wrong, she can correct that for me. But Joanne lives in New York City, where she's been active uh, for tenants' rights and preservation of the Lower East Side since 1980. And she's one of the founders and president of Copekind, a summer project for radical journalists and organizers based in Guilford, Vermont, and dedicated to the memory of Andrew Copekind. Joanne's presentation is entitled For Reason in a Mad World, and she will be discussing how sex scandals reduce the complexity of human life to a story of good and evil. The amplification of evil, the politics of fear and sequential sex panics across the last 50 years have been drivers of the prison state and the culture of vengeance and punishment. This amplification and the way that even arguments against violence may be colonized by it serves to endorse, sustain, and to further empower the system of violence. The ratcheting up of registries, the surveillance, the exclusion zones, all these things that Phil just talked about, uh, they're all products of this culture of punishment and mass incarceration. Joanne submits that the movement for justice is not just a set of discrete causes. Abolition of the registry is just as necessary as campaigns against police violence or for due process or against mass incarceration and racial profiling. If we are to have any hope for a more sane, just, and reasonable society, it must be one fight. Thank you, Joanne, and welcome to Narsal Live. Thank you, Robin. Can you hear me? Yes, um, just fine. Okay, great. So I'm going to make two small corrections to that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, one, I am not a columnist for Mother Jones anymore. Uh, I am a, I am still an independent uh, journalist, and uh, 
until my most recent book, which I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'm also the editor of, with Kevin Gray and Alec, uh, Jeffrey St. Clair, so sorry, of a book called Killing Trayvons, an Anthology of American Violence. So uh, first I wanna thank Paul Shannon for inviting me here and you Robin and Brenda and everyone involved, Nikki, everyone involved in getting this tech support uh, system in a very difficult time arranged and everyone out there who's listening, uh, I appreciate your attention, I appreciate your presence and your interest. And um, so Paul invited me uh, to speak because I have a new book out. And that book is called What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Me Too, Essays on Sex, Authority, and the Mess of Life. So I'm gonna talk about the book uh, and relate it to why we're here today. Um, but first, um, a commercial. So there should be a slide at some point that allows you to purchase this handsome volume. Um, <laughs> and it, it is from Verso Books. And if that slide is inaccessible in some way, um, you can go to versobooks.com. That's V-E-R-S-O-B-O-O-K-S, -O -O -S, one word, no capitals, dot com. And then you get to the site and you click on the top books and then you just scroll down and you see a thumbnail again of this cover. And uh, there's currently a 40% off summer brief special, which you can take advantage of and it makes an excellent gift. So that's the commercial. Now, um, the book is called What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Me Too, but it is not about me too. Um, the title essay concerns the subject, the 2017-2018 media frenzy uh, that brought it to the fore of public attention and uh, thousands of accusations. But I wrote the essay, <clears throat> as I did the other essays in the book, some of which are short comments and others are long reported pieces because for a long time I've been interested in uh, the politics of fear that structures our time. Uh, structures our time in many ways, uh, noticeable and not so noticeable. And I've been interested in the consequences of that politics, in fact, and in our psyches, uh, in the individual psyche, also in the collective national psyche. I've been interested in violence, cauldron of American life, uh, and particularly um, the ways in which even arguments against violence, even the most um, well-intentioned arguments uh, against violence may be colonized by it. So what do I mean by that? Um, you see that in victim statements that say, for instance, 25 years in prison is not enough, uh, 50 years in prison is not enough, life imprisonment is not enough. They say death would be too good for him. Uh, they wish suffering, torture, and rape on a miscreant. Um, you see it in the situational view of rape, the way rape is, as it indeed is, a terrible crime, um, but not if practiced or, or uh, imposed upon somebody convicted or accused of it. You see it in some advocates for prisoners' rights who say, well, rights, except for those people, uh, in measures for the rights of sex, of, sorry, ex-felons, um, except for those people. Uh, the Florida ballot measure that restored voting rights for all ex-felons excluded those who served time for murder and a sex offense, uh, that is a glaring example of this. So, as I say, I've been interested in the politics of fear. I've been interested in violence as a subject that doesn't wear out, um, particularly violence that 
um, doesn't require a weapon. Violence in its most insidious forms, institutional forms, structural forms, media forms. Um, but at heart, I'm interested in the human person. And what does that mean? You know, I'm interested in his weaknesses and his strengths, in her confusions and complications, in all of their contradictions, in the tendency of our popular rhetoric, our politics, and certainly our press uh, to flatten experience, to shun the individual's complications and create narratives of good and evil, monsters and victims. I suppose you could say I am interested in love, in what Dr. King called a radical love, and in resisting what I call the common sense of the time, quite a long time actually, which is structured around the opposite of love, punishment, and vengeance as a social good. Now, anyone who has been the butt end of the punishment and violence system, and you all know this far better than I, um, may have a tendency to think you're all alone. And that's natural. That's how punishment and shunning are supposed to work. And if people of like experience come together, for mutual support, as you have, as you do, there is the comfort of numbers, perhaps, but there remains a social and political aloneness. That's natural, too. That's how exclusion and monsterization work. But what I've been interested in and what the book explores is the various ways in which you're not alone, um, and it's not so apparent, but it is fundamental, really, to the repetition of the monster story, the expansion of the category under which people ever increasingly are defined as monsters, the assumption that no one is paying attention to the pattern, the history, and thus repeatedly we, supposed innocents, uh, can be scared out of our wits. Now this scaring out of our wits, the sequential moral panics, as they're called, sex panics, moral panics, media panics, do have the effect of putting the populace on guard, ready to accept any measure that might keep us safe, supposedly. Um, this seems to be being challenged uh, this minute in the streets as we speak, and I hope we'll talk more about that. But if the repetition of moral panic has had the effect of sending society to its bunkers and its high towers of easy and pitiless judgment. It also unintentionally, perhaps, suggests a way out of aloneness for every group who through every scandal and every panic have come really to constitute a class quite large class of monsters. The quote, damned and despised, as Jesse Jackson called all those whom society, which quaintly likes to call itself civilization, um, marginalizes and punishes. Um, this crew of the damned may not recognize all those out there who are cast on the sea in their separate particular boats of exile. They may not recognize that they have or may not acknowledge allies. 
But the history of moral panic, even in thumbnail, is instructive in suggesting just how vast the population of the damned is, and therefore where alliances ought to be possible. I had to define moral panic, sex panic, for readers of the title essay of my book. And while my purpose there was to situate some features of the Me Too phenomenon in the long history of making monsters and the politics of punishment and fear, I think it also suggests for those who have been on the receiving end, the common threads of experience. And ideally, or certainly potentially, a common politics, a common resistance that might be forged from that experience. So I'm going to read just a, a bit from my book um, to just um, to review that history and experience briefly. So. Uh, a sex panic or moral panic is a social eruption fanned by the media and characterized by alarm over innocence, stereotypically white women and children imperiled. The predator is lurking, mutable social presence, a menace against which the population must be mobilized and has been since at least the white slavery panic of the 1880s to 1910s, but almost continuously since the mid 20th century. That politics of fear has not been trivial. Examples range from the fever over homosexual psychopaths, actually called sexual psychopaths, but really it meant homosexuals in the 1950s, to serial rages since the late 1960s against a whole host of enemies. Sex education, gay sex rings, gay teachers, gay threats to family, stranger danger, crime, porn, satanic ritual abuse in daycare, sexual abuse dug up from repressed memory, AIDS predators, super predators, internet predators, sex offenders as a separate category, of human pedophile priests, epidemic campus rape. Whether formulated for political organizing, the Right Save Our Children campaign against homosexuals in the 1970s, or inflated, concocted from genuine claims, the priest scandal, or entirely concocted, the daycare frenzy, or fueled by exaggerated statistics and unstable classifications, the campus hunting ground, these panics whose practical and ideological work continues past their peak have shared features. Sex figures as a preternatural danger. Emotion swamps reason. Monsters abound and protection demands any sacrifice, including the suppression of opposing views. In the cauldron of panic, definitions collapse. Abuse might be a comment, a caress, a violent act. Suspicion of deeds rouses the same alarm as deeds. Sex, misunderstandings, and mistakes about sex may be labeled deviance depending upon the speaker, depending on the subject. There is no time, no air for distinction. Rape, a terrible and serious crime, is conflated with behavior that may not be criminal at all, with the perverse effect that efforts to ensure fair criminal investigations and eliminate bias against people who report rape are undermined. Insisting on distinctions, on skepticism, on a fundamental element of journalistic requirements of inquiry, and most of all on the rights of any accused, is frequently called denial. Sex panic reverses the order that governs law, where, formally at least, innocence is presumed. 
In panic, all the stories are true, and the accused are guilty by default. Law, having been declared a flawed tool for achieving justice, as indeed it is, naming and shaming takes its place. That shame likely reinforced the foundation from which the panic grew in the first place need not be examined. Garbed as justice, accusations become moral lessons of goods triumph over evil. They thus become increasingly difficult to question. Their proliferation becomes proof of legitimacy. The victims are encouraged, speak your truth. Everyone else is commanded, believe. Typically, panic generates another story, written in the language of law, now resuscitated as a sturdy instrument of justice, reinforcing repressive power, but protecting the rest of us from monsters. Until the next sex panic. So, that's just a kind of capsule history of the process and also of the sequential panics which have really been with us since um, the 1950s, 1960s. The anthropologist Roger Lancaster, whose work Sex Panic and the Punitive State, many of you doubtless know. If you don't, I advise you to read it. It's a wonderful book. Roger Lancaster is his name. Lancaster has a pungent phrase uh, to characterize the feelings of mutual identification and perverse enjoyment that connect those innocents who love to throw stones, call for more law, harsher law, eternal punishment. He calls it a poisoned solidarity. I spent a good deal of my writing life examining this poisoned solidarity in the context of sex scandals. In this book, I explore what exists underneath the scandal, the easy assumptions, the false conclusions, mostly the terrible evasions of society's fear of sex, of our dishonesty about sex. of our irresponsibility for the consequences of our individual and collective um, action. I have tried, or inaction, I've tried in telling stories here on, for instance, an HIV panic in upstate New York where, um, or which has resulted, you know, in a now no longer young man, new Sean Williams, Uh, having served 12 years in prison, being civilly committed to a mental institution as a sexually dangerous person um, on the basis of nothing really an assumption that he was trying to um, infect young women. Uh, There was no evidence that he had that intention. There was evidence only that there was an epidemic, he was infected, and other people, none of whom practiced safe sex with any regularity, also became infected. And now he is um, a monster, a criminal, put away with 6,000 some other people who have been declared sexually dangerous people in a mental institution. That is one story in the book. Um, Another is on the murder of Matthew Shepard and the ease with which garden variety homophobia slipped easily into murder. And therefore, I was interested in the culture of straight men and the culture of violence in Laramie, Wyoming, where that took place. There's a story on the tortures of Abu Ghraib and the ease with which ordinary reserve soldiers, workers at Papa John's and IGA, participated in rituals of humiliation. A story on the accusations against Woody Allen on the priest scandal 
on the police right to strip anyone for any as a result of any arrest. Uh, in all these stories and more, I have tried to challenge the common sense of the time to get the innocent reader to appreciate the mess of life, the complication of life, of reality, um, to recognize reason, to think reasonably against the lie of the simple story of good and evil and to think about all our complicity in the regimes of punishment that have made our country the largest prison state in the world. But while examining this poison solidarity, I have also been acutely interested uh, in the hope, at least, for social solidarity, for human solidarity, for uh, organic, so unpoisoned solidarity. And in the essay that closes the book, um, I, I have an appreciation of the great novelist and essayist James Baldwin. And I note there, and this is a much shorter passage, I note there, uh, Baldwin does not say that systems of power are unimportant. He insists that liberation is also a mandate on individuality. How one separates oneself from the, quote, habits of thought that reinforce and sustain the habits of power. In essence, how one comes into his or her humanity. Now, separating oneself from those habits of thought and thus power uh, is not a quick or simple job. And obviously any person alone, in my case, a writer, a journalist, um, has limited reach. You do what you can. You are responsible to your own politics and intellect and soul. You drill holes sideways, as a friend of mine likes to put it, um, hoping to weaken, perhaps to bring down, the foundations on which so much official cruelty depends. The hopeful news is that a lot of people have been drilling sideways for so long. And the ground is shaking. The damned and despised are making radical demands. Demilitarize the police. Defund the police. Abolish the police. Dismantle the security state in which most everyone is in some ways insecure. Now common sense may say this is crazy, but look where common sense has brought us. The damned and despised have made radical demands forever. We are human beings, declared rebellious slaves. I am a man, declared the sandwich boards read by striking garbage workers, black men, in Memphis in 1968. I am who I am was an anthem of gay liberation. And we should never forget that this country, in this country, sorry, after the black sex fiend, the sexual psychopath, that is the homosexual, was the foundational sex offender until just recently in the history, in the sense of history. It is necessary to see these struggles as one struggle. And I'm not saying it's easy to do that or to forge alliances, but it's necessary because the habit of thought that reinforces and sustains racial profiling, for instance, is linked 
to the habit of thought that reinforces and sustains the sex offense registry. This is a time, it is always a time, to make the connections. There can be no reforming racial profiling. There can be no reforming the registry. Racial profiling, as we see, ends in death. With the registry, there can be no saying, maybe it's okay for those people, but not for these. Or maybe it's okay for the organized forces of violence, the police, to keep such lists, but not for the public, from whence come vigilantes. As we know, the registry ends in death too. Social death, or as most recently in Nebraska, actual death. I mentioned Florida earlier, um, which I think is a prime, and this is a prime moment to think about alliances and think about united demands. As the rules for restoring the vote to ex-felons are now under review for being onerous, the restriction that says some ex-felons are forever felons, subhuman, without rights, beyond the circle of civic engagement forever, this must be challenged. As someone said, no one deserves forever to be judged and punished for the worst moments of his or her life. We all have to strive against the common sense of the time to come into our humanity. We do it for ourselves, of course, and while underappreciated, we do it, we must do it, for the sake of humanity. So I'll leave it at that, and thank you very much. Joanne, yes, this is Robin. Hi. Can Hi, you Robin. hear me? Hey, yes. thank you for your presentation. We really appreciate the. We have a we have a we have a few questions here. Um, oh. So let me start with the first one. Um, the question somebody asked was: Is uh, seductive Dressing and or suggestive actions a sex offense? I'm not even sure you can answer that, but you want to take a crack at it? Well, no, obviously it's not a sex offense. It's not a sex offense, nor is it a solicitation to crime. It's usually, um, you know, it's usually brought up in connection with saying somebody wanted um, to be violated in some way. So, uh, I don't believe it's a crime, and I don't believe it's um, it's a solicitation for crime. Okay. Um, another question we have is, uh, do you think the Me Too movement would support not reporting sexual assault as a crime? And if the police are abolished, who would they report the crime to? Um, interesting question. Um, I could... Could you repeat the first part of it? Would Me Too the support? Not reporting sexual assault as a crime. No, of course. Me Too is all about crime. Me Too is all about crime and punishment. Um, so Me Too would never be. Me, Me Too is not arguing for the abolition of the police. Me Too is not arguing for the end of long sentences. Um, me Too is not arguing against the police state or against the humiliation essential to work or many, many other things. So, um, so no, that's not an issue for Me Too, but, uh, but it is a question of importance. And, uh, and it's a question of importance because there are people... Uh, so we ought to understand that Me Too was two things. Um, there was hashtag Me Too, which became part of what I think was a media panic, a moral panic. 
Um, but then there was the origin of that hashtag, which um, hashtag Me Too kind of hijacked Me Too, which was a device that had been uh, created in the context of uh, of classes that were being held by a black woman named Tarana Burke with black and uh, other women of color and girls. Um, and the idea of Me Too was a kind of way of giving people a hearing, giving people who had suffered violence, who had experienced something that was very hard for them to discuss, a way to say, to code, in the context of this class, I have something to say. Something happened to me too, also, you know, but I'm not ready. But I want you to know that I, at some point, want a hearing. So that origin, that origin of Me Too was really about, you know, having authority over your own self, your own body, your own life. Um, it was not about um it was not what hashtag me too was which hashtag me too was about kind of the mass promulgation of accusation and the uh, denial of a hearing to anyone who was accused it said uh your time is up you should shut up you can't answer the accusation you can't defend yourself go away so um but out of the same communities where the original Me Too grew out of, which are largely um, communities of color, people, of course, have been very concerned about the fact that huge numbers of people have police records, have been in the in custody, have been in prison, have, um, you know, uh, reduced chances of life because of that. And so there has developed a lot of thinking about... Um, what's called restorative justice or reparative justice. And the ideas that are being thought about there are, uh, you know, how do we deal with harm? I mean, harm is in the world. And, and one, we have to think about ways to reduce it, but we also have to think about ways to deal with it. And, and how would we deal with harm in a way that, that thought more about repair, uh, what used to be called rehabilitation, than, um, than punishment. And there is an excellent book out uh, now, also by Verso, which I would encourage people to get. Um, it's called The Feminist and the Sex Offender. And it's written by Judith Levine and Erica Miners. And it just came out uh, a month ago. And it's all about this effort to think through a different way of dealing with um, dealing with harm and not not ripping apart communities and not ripping apart lives and not tossing people on the ash heap uh, in which you know they their futures are finished and also of course recognizing you know what happened to somebody. Um, recognizing that, that people are hurt and that they do want some recognition and some, uh, the, you know, uh, not vengeance, but uh, recognition and, and, uh, and remorse, really, and rehab. So, yeah. Okay. Um, you got about five minutes left. Let me, there's actually quite a few questions have come in but i don't think we'll be able to won't be able to get to them all here's one here's one would you uh, do you think the reaction to mr floyd's murder in minneapolis would have been different if the victim had been on the registry that's a interesting question um i think that uh, let's Let's think for a minute. A lot of black men have been murdered. A lot of their murders have been shown on television. There was something absolutely horrifying about, more horrifying 
than all the other horrifying ones we have seen uh, because um, because of the the policeman's almost nine minute crushing of the breath and the life out of a human person and not and with his hands in his pocket and apparently quite uh, quite nonchalant and and that I think uh, on top of all the other things has um, has you know galvanized society but I, I do think that you know the question does get to this this point about the the trick bag of the perfect victim and while I can't answer a hypothetical, I think we always have to stay away from the perfect victim. George Floyd was not a perfect victim, after all. He did have a police record. He had issues in his life that were not uh, simple. He had a messy life. Um, so I think, um, you know, we, we all have to guard against the idea like, oh, but look, he was so pure. No, everyone's life is complicated. Thank you. Um, Let's see, we've got some time. Here's another one. Um, how do you think sex offender registries relate, if at all, to systemic homophobia? Um, that's an interesting question as well. Um, I think if you, uh, if you recognize that back in the day um, when homosexuals were being rounded up, were being arrested in parks, uh, there were lists. People often don't know this or don't think about it, but there were lists kept by police of, you know, perverts. And um, these people could be, often were, uh, thrown out of their jobs. They were often, uh, you know, they were blackmailable if the cops chose to blackmail them. Um, their lives were secret and they were hunted. And, um, and they were, you know, during the Red Scare of the 1950s, you know, they were on a sort of registry in the federal government. They were considered as dangerous as communists. There were lists uh, kept. More of them had their... Uh, careers in government destroyed than communists did. Um, this history is largely forgotten because now we think, oh, pride is just so mainstreamed. But, you know, uh, as I said, the homosexual was the original sex offender, was one of the original sex offenders. And so everything that uh, people fought uh, was about their monstrosity. It was, a, an, a, they made a demand that they were human beings. They were who they were. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a mistake to forget that history of repression. All right. Um, do you want to try one more? We got about two minutes. Sure. Um, sure. Let's see if I can pick with quite a few to come in here. Has the Me Too movement made reform more difficult despite all the good that it does for the class of people abused by historical power and crime. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. I think in that the Me Too phenomenon never challenged the police state in that it never thought about the ways in which accusation equals guilt, uh, bleeds into, from the media, bleeds into law, the way the presumption of guilt um, bleeds into actual you know, criminal proceedings in courts. Um, I think it has not been a force for good. I think uh, to the extent it has made people speak up, um, I think that's excellent. I think people should speak up. I think people should always speak up and they should be, we should teach children to speak up from early on. That means we have to, we have to fight against shame, we have to fight against sexual lying, we have to fight against this whole world that's supposedly, you know, dirty, and we can talk about violence, we can we can expose children to violent things, the most horrible things, but oh my God, we can't talk about sex, we, you know, it's too dirty. So that's, that's a real, uh, that's a real problem. Um, 
uh, I don't think so. I don't think Me Too has has uh, contributed to um, a lessening of the police state. I do think that the reaction to it, though, uh, and especially now, uh, I think it's in some trouble because a lot of people suddenly say, oh, well, we're not about believing all women. Uh, we're after all, we you know, we don't believe Tara Reid because we like Joe Biden. So then that creates a, a real contradiction, because if your belief is based on how much you like the accused, then you have no principle. All right. Well, that is all the time we have. We're a little bit over. Thank you so much. I'm going to do a special favor for you. Hopefully this won't destroy our platform. Uh, but I want to make sure people get an opportunity to purchase your book. Again, the title of um, her book is What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Me Too. And again, if this goes as I expect it to, everybody's going to get a message on your screen, and that will provide you with a hyperlink where you can go if you're interested and purchase uh, Joanne's book. So here Buy we go. With, book. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to, uh, at this point, thank I think we're so queued. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank we appreciate you having here. Don, uh, we're going to queue Don up now. And this time we're actually going to go to lunch, folks. I was wrong before. I was just hungry. If, if there is some way um, hey, people can be Robin. sent. This is Brenda coming in just by, by sound. Uh, uh -huh. Nikki, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, Joanne still has a little more time. You, you're you're way huh. too hungry. Oh, uh, oh my. So well, we've got if, more questions. If Joanne, yeah, if Joanne's got yes. a few more questions, yes. just go for it, and I'll just be. Yeah, I'm back fine. And, All right. Well, Don you... will come in and interrupt when when we're when Good. we're ready. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was I was too anxious right. to get get rid of you, Joanne. I apologize. So <laughs> we've sorry. got more we've got more questions. Um, Here's one. Um, somebody's asking, has uh, have the protests shown uh, to result in bringing awareness to this issue? Uh, that being said, why has the sex offender injustices been silent in mainstream society? Well, you know, I mean, that's I I I hate to say or maybe I don't hate to say. I mean, that's on you. That's really, you know, oppressed people have to fight their battles. And yours is a very difficult one. There's no question. Uh, but you have to find alliances with people who are uh, similarly, in, in different ways, but similarly repressed. Because what the registry really is, what the sex offense registry is, is an assault on humanity. It is a tool of the police state, of the prison state, of the punishment system, of that habit of power that can forever exile people. And, you know, we've seen it operate. We've seen it operate against, still operates against black people. It operates on against homosexuals still. It operates against women. It operates against sex offenders or people on the registry. I hate that, you know, calling people like forever uh, the, the crime they were convicted of or whatever. Um, but I really think that people have to make alliances. I, I think there is no way and you have to find, there's no way not to, and you have to find that common thread because as much as people on the registry have been hounded and demeaned and debased and made to feel small and silent, you know, people have always been, uh, have always been tried to be crushed like that. And, and you know, you can have as many, you don't have too many journalists who actually write about it and who argue about it, but, um, but you have to make a noise, you know, you have to make a noise and, and then you have to make some strategic alliances and you have to, I think, I mean, I'm saying you have to, but I don't, you know, I, I'm, this is what I, I believe. This is what I feel. I feel that, um, you know, oppressed people have to take their own fight and and come with simple, clear statements uh, to the rest of the population to say, this is unjust. This is uh, 
this is an act of, of, of hatefulness. This cannot stand. We cannot have regimens by which people are eternally punished. And then make the connections to the other instances of the same and to the institutional prison state and punishment system and corporate you know, linkages who make money off of people's suffering. Suffering is a powerful issue. Freedom is a powerful issue. You have to come with the right words and with the right alliances. Um, and it's not easy. And it takes some time. But this is a moment. This is a real moment where the earth is shaking. Uh, because people are questioning the mechanisms of violence. And I think you need to take advantage of it. Because the registry is one huge mechanism of violence. Thanks. Um, I have a question uh, that came in about the media and you having a background uh, with the media. The question is wondering whether what 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 level of culpability do you think the media has in fostering well, the environment? Well, huge, absolutely immense. I mean, they're not Media panics and moral panics are almost synonymous. You know, every time you pick up the tabloid press, every time someone is called the devil, every time someone is called, New Sean Williams, the fellow with HIV, he was called the devil. He was called a lethal Lothario. He was a young black man who dealed drugs upstate New York, and he was called some kind of player, some kind of sicko, some kind of person who was trying to commit mass murder. You know, there was no evidence of this. But the media loves a good monster. So the monster story must be resisted at all times. And yes, the media ought to be resisted. And, you know, the, it's, it's, it's an absolute... Um, it's an absolute machine for creating fear and panic. And again, what I find interesting about the current moment is that the media has sort of stoked people's love for the police and the police state through television shows and all kinds of things for the longest time. All of a sudden, the media is kind of trying to catch up like, oh, my God, oh, we stand with the protesters. Oh, we weren't for this. We weren't for killing men in streets. Well, men have been killed in streets for years and more than killed in streets. Men are killed silently. Women are killed silently. Children are killed silently. All kinds of ways by the state, by the mechanisms of the state, that has to be uncovered. But every every moment of social of social explosion, and this is one, I think has to be uh, exploited. I mean, I hate to use the word exploited, but I mean, you have to take advantage of it. People, oppressed people have to take advantage of it. Okay. Um, we have still a little more time. This is a longer question. Um, okay. But I... I feel like it's probably a useful question to ask, um, so bear with me. I'm going to read it here. Age-appropriate sex and relationship education in various European nations is recognized as an effective tool to cut sex abuse and similar mm -hmm. concerns. In the United mm -hmm. States, sex education is apparently feared as much as our sex crimes themselves. If yes. effective sex and relationship education were ever to be established and accepted in the in the United States, do you believe it would have a positive impact against the fears you've been discussing? I believe it would, and I believe it's essential. Uh, and and I think, I mean, just think, just think as any thinking person. So we say to kids, sex is about uh, dirtiness and disease and death. Oh, but once you get married, then then it's great. Okay, but it's this really awful, ick, ugly, icky, oh, shameful, let's not talk about it thing. But but your parents, my gosh, your parents did it to create you. So what kind of cognitive dissonance does it create with the child? The child is obviously confused. And then later, since marriage is held out as the uh, the, the teacher for sex education via like abstinence education, that we have. Um, the alternative, since most kids don't wait till marriage, the alternative is porn. And, you know, porn might be interesting for all kinds of reasons, and it might be actually beneficial in 
uh, in in for adults who want to play. But uh, it's not, you know, it's fantasy sex and it's not real sex and it doesn't describe real sex and it's not useful um, as a tool for education. So uh, I think it's, I'm going to add something here, though, that's really important because the fight against sex education began in 1968 and it began, um, it began by, it was a tool for the right to recreate itself. So the John Birch Society and uh, the Family Values people, the, the evangelical Christians, um, they could no longer uh, you know, the Birchers could no longer rely on racism and on communism really to organize um, a base. And so what they did was they decided that sex would be a base to create political power. And you can read this. There's a uh, there's a terrific book called Talking. I think it's called Talking About Sex. Um, and it's about the history of sex education as a way uh, the uh, opposition to sex education as a way of building political power, building the right, building the um, the, the most extreme wing of the Republican Party. Uh, and and it, it wasn't really, they, they weren't really that interested in sex education. They were interested in, a, in scaring a population into voting with them. And that, and it was full, it used, it used um, a kind of language of hysteria a language of freak out. Um, James Dobson from Focus on the Family said, words are bullets. And what he meant by that is that their sole purpose is to fire and to hit their target. And it really doesn't matter if they're true or not. It doesn't matter um, what uh, what the content is so long as it, as it hits the target, which was uh, to... Uh, scare the wits out of people and cause them to join forces uh, to fight the, the demons. And the demons in that case were, you know, actually other Republican, con- more or less conservative women who were trying to uh, institute sex education in the schools so that um, children had some kind of grounding, you know, some sort of reasonable grounding uh, in understanding about uh, their bodies and their lives and their relationships and their futures. Okay. So um, um, I'd like to say just one more, I'd just like to make the commercial one more time. Uh, my book is called What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Me Too, Essays on Sex, Authority, and the Mess of Life. It's from versobooks.com. Um, you can find it under books. It's on sale now, especially. So. Well, thank you. And maybe you I'm have gonna, a slide. I'm, well, I'm going to push out the link one more time uh, here. And so everybody who's still watching will, will see this on their screen. And they can just hit the link and go straight to the Verso website and, and purchase many books if they <laughs> are, are You so get inclined. a free ebook, I think, with the purchase of a hardback. Well, that's even greater incentive. Thank you again so much for your time. We appreciate you being here today. It was a great presentation. We had some really interesting questions. So thank the folks thank for you so submitting much. their questions. And um, I think at this point, I will, if he's available, uh, turn this mic over to Don. Don, are you are you with us? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>